So uh -huh. hello everyone, welcome back to our Toronto AI and Robotics L seminar. Today we are glad to have Jun Yang to give a talk on 60 pose estimation for textureless objects on RGB frames using multi-view optimization. Jun yeah. Yang is a fourth year PhD student in the Toronto Robotic and AI Lab at the University of Toronto Aerospace Studies. His research interests include computer vision, machine learning and robotics with the focus of active perception for, robot, for robotic grasping. He has seven years of industry research experience. Prior to this, he received his master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from University of Ottawa in 2015. So Yang, we're all, uh, Jun, we're all looking forward to your talk. Please feel free to take over. All right, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, C. Um, all right, thanks everyone for uh, joining my hour, like uh, talk. So today I'm gonna give the presentation for this topic. It's a six stop post estimation for the textureless object on the RGB frames units in multi view optimization. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Let's start. Okay. So for the six stop, for the because uh, today the topic is for the six stop object post estimation, right? So for the six stop object post estimation, yeah. the goal for this for this uh, task is to estimate this full six stop pose, the three D translation and the three D rotation of this uh, rigid object from this uh, uh, different input data modality like RGB or RGBD images. So for this uh, particular topic for the for this task, normally like uh, we assume this object model is known in advance, so we know exactly what we are looking for. Right, like in this example, uh, we want like for, we want to ask, we want to find the six of pose of this uh, duck, right? And in the test image, whatever is the RGB or RGBD image, we're using our approach to just to get this model aligned to this image to get this full six of pose of this object. All right. Okay. And for this uh, six of pose, right? It uh, certainly have a lot of the uh, a large like a lot of applications, right? So like this augmented reality. Is autonomous driving and uh, for the robot uh, grasping, like the robotic pin picking, right? And uh, for this uh, for this specific task, right? We like I mentioned before, we can use different data modalities, right? Like RGB images, the RGBD, or like even depths only, right? There's a different approach, different different uh, model data modalities in the literature in the previous work. So traditionally, like in the like a long time ago, uh. People generally using this, uh, uh, like this uh, uh, traditional features, like the safety features. They perform this uh, feature matching between this model to this object in the in the, in the data frames, and uh, then perform this uh, like PMP to get the object pose. So one problem for this uh, like uh, classical approach is that uh, it assumes like we have this uh, rich texture on the object. Like like in this case, right? We have all have these uh, abundant features. Right, that uh, will allow us to do this feature matching. But the problem that uh, when we have this textureless object, it's a feature matching, it totally fails, right? And for this textureless object, it appears a lot in this uh, in our in our in our daily lives and uh, also in its industrial environments, right? Like the bin picking, most of the objects are are like a metallic and uh, has no texture. Okay, so how do we do this? So to solve this uh, object pose estimation on the textureless objects, right? Like in the literature, when we people are normally using this depths of this RGBD data to like uh, to do this object pose estimation. So when we have this uh, high quality depths data, we're normally able to get a very reliable, very accurate object pose estimates. Like in this case, uh, this paper, the PV PV study, which is a 2020 CVPR paper. It using this uh, both RGB and the depth images to get a reliable object pose estimation. So for this problem, for this uh, using depths or this RGBD based approach is that, so the, for this kind of approach, they all rely on this uh, high quality of the depths. So which means that when your depth quality degrades, your object pose estimation performance also degrades, right? So like in this case, right, when we, have this uh, high quality depth. So you see that we can see a lot of geometric features for the objects using this high cost sensor. But when we use something like low cost sensor, which is like, uh, we can see that the depth data, it's the profile quality, it drops a lot. It's very like, 
very unclear for this uh, geometric features. Right? And um, that's one problem. Another problem is that uh, when we have this, uh, like this uh, shiny object surfaces, that's actually a big problem in the, especially in the industrial domain, right? For the like, for the robot beam picking, right? So what happened that uh, for the object that has this uh, matte or this close to Lambertian surfaces, this depth camera, like the active stereo or this TUF sensor, can generate a very reliable depths. But for when the object has this uh, shiny surface or this uh, dark or the transparent surfaces, there is a lot, there will be a lot of missing depth data. So this in, missing depths will happen even if you're using this uh, high cost sensor. Right? So for the, when you're giving this quality of the depth data, whatever is the low quality with the low cost sensor, all this uh, like the missing depth data, we will, this will degrade this object post activation performance. And to solve this problem, like in our previous story, Sorry, uh, can this be solved by yeah. a, maybe a better camera or if it's some interesting property of these depth cameras? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question, Siri. So, so for uh, this problem, right, because uh, like, uh, yeah, so for my entire PhD studies, right, so I would like to say like we divide it into half, right? In my first half of my PhD, I tried this a lot to solve this depth problem. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we, we made the assumption that uh, Okay, this uh, optimal depth data can guarantee your object post admission performance, right? But the problem for this, uh, like for the shiny, for example, like this a shiny object, is that, uh, and that's actually uh, one one trial from my previous work, right? So for the shiny object, it's that uh, the reason we have this missing depth is that because it's all this light from this uh, projector, like you see the light projector, right? It uh, hit on the surface, and uh, all the reflect back to the camera. And, the, and this could result into a, like the sat image that saturation, right? So for yeah. this kind of particular problem, even if you use uh, even if you're using a very high cost camera, you still have could have this problem. Yeah. yeah. So I and see. then yeah, another another solution that you we use some like a depth completion technology with a dense uh, with the advent with this uh, development of this uh, neural network, right? So we using network to predict it, to estimate this uh, depth to fill all these holes, but okay. that's work. Uh, the limitation is that when we have this small missing, small portion of the missing, that work uh, that uh, solution works very well. But when we have this large missing area, like to see the, this object, half of mm -hmm. this uh, surface is missing, right? For that problem, depth uh, completion technology, like ge generally have this very low quality outputs. Right? So mm -hmm. that's the fundamental problem in this, uh, in for this uh, shiny object or this uh, transparent object, right? Hey, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually that regression that actually brings me the what I want to discuss in the next, right? So let's say in, like in my previous work at the beginning of my PhD, right? So we tr what we tried is that we want to using this to want to using this multi view strategy to actually to sense this depths, right? To sense the depth from different viewpoint and fuse them together into, to get a, to get a, uh, like this uh, higher quality and have a better completion of the steps, right? We can see certainly that, we can see certainly that from when we combine this uh, depths uh, images from different viewpoints, right? We're able to get a very like uh, complete and high quality depths, right? So, but so the limitation of this approach is that, uh, Generally, for this, uh, like for example, for this industrial application, right, which require very, very like accurate depths, right? For this particular application, the depth sensing is uh, from per from the individual viewpoint is actually already time consuming. Generally, like a, it can spend like a one seconds to sense the an image from one viewpoint, and the, like a seem like you can think like a, when we. Uh, when we sense the depths from different viewpoints, that's very time consuming. That's one problem. Another problem is that for this depth fusion from multiple viewpoints, like um, it's still like the quality is still bounded by this uh, depth sensor itself, right? So on the left side, we're using this uh, high cost, it's a fusion result from this uh, high cost uh, industrial camera, which is like a, it can exceed like a $10,000, uh, uh, right? And on the right side, it's a depth fusion using a very low cost uh, real sense camera with probably only like a 200 USD. But we can see, and we can see that using this low cost sensor, the depth fusion from multi viewpoint, the quality is still quite bad. 
yeah, which means that uh, the depth fusion, using depth fusion, the quality is still bounded by this uh, per frame measurement, depth measurement. So because of all this problem, right, that's actually bring the opportunity for this RGB based approaches. Right? And so in the past few years, a lot of the researchers have been working on this object post estimation using this RGB images only. So like, uh, like in the literature, there's a uh, different direction, right? For example, so in this work, they're using this uh, template matching approach, right? To, to, to estimate this object pose from, from the individual frames. And so that's one direction. And another direction is this a two-stage approach. So what they do is that uh, they leverage a network to predict this uh, key point for the input images. And as long as we have this uh, multiple key points associated with this model, and then we can perform and then perform this model based, uh, like for example, this PMP based approach to estimate this object pose. So that's what people normally do in this, uh, in this, using this uh, uh, single view based RGB based approach to estimate object pose. Okay. But uh, this approach, right, the RGB based uh, solutions, it certainly has some limitation, has some problem. It's intrinsic problems, right? One problem is this uh, unknown scale and the depths, right? So we can see, especially for this uh, template matching based approach, right? So from this 2D image, because we do not have this scale information. So when we, so for this, for example, like the, for this template matching based approach, what people normally do is that they render this, uh, they train this object templates on the, in the training stage or in the, off, in the offline stage. And in the wrong time, they just do this uh, matching to the on the test image between this uh, between the templates and the test image. And because the scale is generally is not is not known in advance, so when the when they train the templates has different scale within the test image, you probably will have the very bad estimates, right? In the first two cases, we have this uh, wrong estimates because of this uh, inconsistent skills. And in the third image, when we have the correct scale, we'll have this uh, correct estimate. So that's one limitation. And another limitation, another limitation is this uh, intrinsic uh, uh, ambiguity appearance and or this ambiguity pers perspective ambiguity problem. So we can see that uh, you know, for some objects, right, because you only had this two D information, it's like for example for this particular object, even if it flips a hundred degrees, it's still difficult to say like. Uh, to determine its uh, its uh, its uh, rotation, right? So for for example, like in this case, when we using this uh, uh, PV net, this key point based approach, this solution. So because it's intrinsic perspective ambiguity, this key point prediction can be totally messed up, right? So in like in the, in the on this on this case, right? This estimate this uh, key point is completely it's completely wrong, right? Because it's uh, the, the network cannot differentiate this uh, perspective. So that's what happened in this RGB image. So to conclude that, it's that uh, for uh, for the RGB single on the RGB based solution, from the single viewpoint, it has this uh, intrinsic limitations, and that's why in the literature there's some people using this uh, multi view based approach. And for this multi view based approach, they can further uh, categorize into this uh, offline based uh, approach, like this uh, on the left side, this Gaussy pose. So for this post, they, they, for this kind of approach, they they acquire this multi, they capture the multi view in RGB images from different viewpoint, and uh, do this uh, batch based approach to global optimize the object pose from multiple frames. So that's one solution. Another solution is this incremental based approach. It is like SLAM, right? So for this uh, kind of approach, so for each timestamp, you only acquire one image, and so. Yeah, so when you have this, uh, when you have when you accumulate more and more viewpoints, your results expect to get better and better, right? So this is like this incremental filter based approach. So for all this approach, right, even though they can improve this overall performance, but they still have this, uh, uh, they still need to, have, they still have this difficulty to handle this, uh, like this uh, object symmetries, this uh, uh, uncertainties, like this is appearance ambiguities. And also, they have the need to uh, need to tackle this uh, possible occlusions. Right? So that's all these challenges in this uh, multi-view based approach using RGB frames.
Okay. So that's why, uh, like, uh, we this way. so in this, so that's why in this, uh, in our work, we propose this framework to address all these challenges using this RGB image, or using only RGB images from the different viewpoints. So the core idea for our approach is uh, is the explicitly decoupling of this uh, object uh, translation and the rotation. So you see that, like in uh, so you see here's our like the, our overall framework, right? Our our pipeline. So our pipeline is based on this uh, periphery prediction of this object segmentation mask, and this a two D detection of this object center. So we first uh, optimize this three uh, D translational, three D translational to get the translation estimate, and using this information, then we can obtain this uh, object scale information that will greatly simplify and help this rotation estimation. And then we perform this uh, max mixture uh, max mixture formulation to optimize this uh, rotation estimation, and this will give us the full six dot pose estimation. Right. So that's our overall pipeline of our approach. So, 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 given this, uh, so, so, so formally, it's a problem, right? So, given this three uh, D three D object model and this multi view images. Our goal is to estimate this uh, rigid transformation from this uh, object model frame to this uh, word frame. You may I ask a question? Yeah, here? go ahead. Yeah. So in, in this in this example, there is one uh, uni u unique 3D transformation, but Tila's data set contains a lot of objects that have a big bunch of symmetries. In some cases, even rotational symmetries. Mm -hmm. But uh, in other cases, it's at least some symmetries coming from the symmetry group. Um, how how do you account for that, or do you do you treat symmetries somehow in your work, or did I over yeah. look that far? Yeah, actually, so in our work, we also explicitly handle the symmetries, right? So I think I'll, I'll bring more details in the following in the following slides, right? So basically, like in our work, in the so like in our pipeline, right? So here, just the overall pipeline. So, but in our, for the rotation, because for the symmetry or this ambiguity part is mostly happening on the symmetry, on the on the rotational part, not the translation part, right? So but that's why we explicitly decouple this rotation and translation. And we explicitly handle this uh, symmetry and this uh, perspective ambiguities only on, on, the, on, this, on the rotation part using this uh, global optimization. We would, I would do introduce more details in the following. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, all right, okay. So for this, our problem formulation, right? So the problem for our for our object post estimation is that uh, given this known 3D mo object model and uh, this multi view images, what we want to do is that we want to estimate this rigid transformation from this object model frame to the global world frame. So we assume that we already know this camera pose in advance, which is a cap from the camera relative to this word frame. So for this camera pose, we so which means that we're not doing a full slam in the R work. We assume the camera pose is known. So this for this camera pose, it can be we can certainly we can reliably get it from using this, for example, using this uh, a robot for kinematics if we have a robot arm, or we can just apply a, a like a an off-the-shelf slam approach to get this camera pose. Okay, um, okay. So, so again, like uh, so for our problem for 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 problem formulation, right? So, given our problem in that, uh, given this uh, observations from this uh, timestamp one to the timestamp t up to come up to the current timestamp, our purpose is, our goal is to estimate this uh, for this uh, posterior of this uh, sixty object pose, right? Represented in the SE three, and um, that's so that's our goal. Uh, which and for this uh, entire SE three, it decouple it can be further decoupled into this three uh, D translation and the three D rotation part. So the direct computation of this term is generally difficult. That's actually uh, Professor Eager's question, right? So how do we uh, handle the symmetries? So for our problem, because it's explicit handle this is generally difficult. The reason is because for the trans for the three D object translation, it's relatively straightforward. Usually, it's represented as a uni model, like a uni Gaussian, uni model Gaussian, right? But for the rotational part, it's more challenging, right? Especially when we have this uh, 
when we have these uh, symmetries, we have these appearance ambiguities and possible occlusions. So which means that the representation of the rotation and transition is different. And that's why in our work, right, in our work, we explicitly decouple this part to decouple this uh, posterior into this uh, translation and the rotation part. So for the translation part, it's a unimodal Gaussian, right? So for this, uh, for this unimodal Gaussian, it's a, it's a, we only have one peak, one certain peak. And for the rotation part, because we need to handle these symmetries, these uh, uncertain ambiguities, right? And uh, for the, all this, because of, because of all this, we, that's why we we model this uh, rotation part as a mixture of this uh, Gaussian distribution. And for each peak, it represents uh, one rotation hypothesis, right? And different when the, for each mode, for each uh, component, it has different weight, represent the, the represent the confidence of this uh, of each mode. Okay. So from this equation, we can see that uh, this uh, translation and the rotation they are not uh, completely they are not independent. The reason we're doing this is that because for this uh, translational part, it's uh, only depend on this input image, right? But and the, but for the rotation part, the reason we say that the rotation is conditional by translation is because this uh, translation encode this uh, 2D location and the scale of the object in the image, in the image domain. And uh, based on this information, our rotational estimation can take advantage of this part. Right, and make our rotation estimation much more, much easier and more reliable. I would just give more, I will give more details for this part. All right, again, so within, within this formulation, uh, now I'll just uh, bring back to the, bring this, uh, this pipeline again, right? So with this formulation, our multi-view framework compromise of this uh, two, uh, two, uh, two major steps, is the upper part and the lower part. So in the first step, we estimate this 3D translation by integrating this per frame neural network predictions into a global optimization framework. So this network predict this uh, segmentation mask and this is a and this is a 2D projection of this uh, 3D model origin. And this 3D translation can be estimated by minimizing a 2D reprojection error. And given this uh, 3D uh, 3D translation estimate, and in the second in the second stage we can recrop a rotational independent ROI for each object using this estimated scale from the translation. And then we feed this uh, ROI into a rotation estimator to get a per frame rotation measurement. And finally, the, our final rotational estimate can be estimated using another optimization. Okay, so let's start with this uh, translational part. So as shown in this figure, right? So for the, our 3D translation, we, what we want to estimate is this, uh, the coordinate of this uh, 3D model origin in the relatively to this uh, word frame. So, so, like, um, so from, from this equation, we can see that uh, given, the RB, uh, given the RGB images from an arbitrary camera viewpoint, this uh, translational, this 3D object translation can be recovered by this falling projection. So, which means that if we are able to estimate this two uh, D projection of this uh, model origin in the in the image domain, and also estimate its depth, which is uh, the which is uh, from this uh, cameras from this uh, from this uh, object uh, model center to this camera center, if we're able to this also estimate this information, the depth information, we're able to fully recover this three uh, D translation, right? And uh, and uh, in our work. We basically were using network to predict this 2D projection of this model origin and using a multi-view optimization to recover the steps. So specifically for our two for our 2D estimation part, we're using we our work is based on this PV net, but instead of estimating this multiple key points, where we only estimate this the 2D center point. So given this input image, right? We first are using run the using this uh, YOLO to detect this two uh, D bounding box of each object, and for each detection, this uh, this uh, PV net can estimate this uh, pixel wise binary mass of the object and a two D vector fields towards this uh, object center, and a random step based approach is finally used to estimate this mean and covariance of this two uh, D object center. 
and to estimate the, uh, the, our translational, or to estimate the 3D translation. And because we have this per frame observation and this known camera poses, we can formulate as a nonlinear optimization problem by assuming this uh, unimodal model Gaussian error model. So this is very similar to this uh, SLAM like a backhand, but uh, instead, instead of estimating this uh, both camera pose and this uh, 3D landmarks, for our problem is it's like only as we can treat it as as this uh, mapping only. We only estimate this uh, landmark, which means in our case it's uh, estimation of this uh, it's optimization of this uh, 3D object translation using this uh, known camera pose. Okay, so for our so so because we know this uh, camera pose right, and uh, for each uh, from this object association from view to views, right, we can perform this object association using this epipolar line constraints, and then using all this information and to, to estimate this object pose to uh, sorry to estimate this object translation. So we solve this uh, so we solve this optimizing problem using a iterative Gaussian Newton procedure, right? So for iteration, we come for each for each iteration, we compute the Jacobian and with this known measurement uncertainties that's predicted from this uh, neural network, right? We're using this information to add, to estimate this through the object translation. So we can see that uh, uh, like uh, as a accumulation of the viewpoints, where if it's the translation estimation, the translation estimate can be basically can be converged with uh, only like a three or few viewpoints to get a very reliable three D translation estimate. All right. Okay. So that's uh, so that's uh, for this uh, 3D translational part, and for this uh, object rotation part, it's uh, more it's a uh, it's not that straightforward, right? Like I mentioned before. So our trans our rotation estimation part is shown at the bottom of this of this figure, right? So <coughs> excuse. So so for our work, right? We're using a very like a very straightforward this uh, template matching approach to acquire this uh, per frame rotation measurement and to integrate this measurement using uh, another optimization approach. Right? So to handle this uh, this uh, symmetries and this uh, uncertainty ambiguities, right? We're using this um, a max mixture formulation for this uh, global optimization. So for this uh, template matching based approach, right? Like you mentioned, uh, we're using very very straightforward template matching approach to demonstrate our to demonstrate the effectiveness of our two-stage formulation. So for a template matching based approach, so the general pipeline is that we render this object templates from this uh, from view sphere in the offline training stage. And in the runtime, we match this uh, template to this runtime images to acquire this uh, per frame rotation estimates. So in general, like um, we discussed before, for in general, this for this for this uh, template matching for this uh, template matching based approach, the most difficult difficult part is this unknown scale. So in the you can see like if we do not have this correct scale, which is uh, not identical to the training training image, we have this uh, we'll have a very like a very we we'll have this uh, this wrong estimates. So and in the literature to handle this problem, people normally have to train this uh, templates using with this uh, different skills, right? So what happened that uh, they train this uh, this templates at the different the, at different depths at different distance, and to generate a lot of templates for this template match. But in our work, instead of training this with uh, multiple skill and uh, multiple depths, we only train we we'll solve this problem with only one skill. So how do we do this? So the reason we can do we can train with only one skill is because we already get this reliably accurate translation from the, in our in our first stage. So in the runtime, right, giving this a 3D translation estimate by applying this uh, perspective geometry, right, we can recrop an, an image. We can recrop this uh, object using this R, for this ROI, right. So this uh, recrop the image. We we'll have this object in the image center. And the object will have the same pixel size as the training templates. So you see here is our training templates, and this is our original like raw array, right? So by applying this uh, perspective geometry, we're able to recrop the image to resize this uh, this raw image. So the resize the image should have this uh, same size as in the training templates, 
and also position in the center. And for and for rotation, so so giving this, so we're using this approach to get this per frame rotation measurement. And given this rotation measurement from each individual viewpoint, we can estimate our global object rotation, which is from this object frame to this uh, word frame using another optimization scheme. So here, so right, so we have this uh, per frame measurement here, right? Per frame measurement. This is acquired for you. This is acquired from this uh, template matching based approach, and we have we know the camera pose, right? So, and for this global optimization. Right, this uh, global which is from the object to the world. This is what we want to optimize. So to optimize this, we can perform this global optimization by operating on this attention space within the Lie algebra. And for this object symmetry, right? So for the object symmetry to handle it, we leverage this known symmetry orders and this known symmetry axis in the optimization. So specifically. So when we, for each uh, for each step for each optimization stage step, right, when we receive a rotation measurement, we explicitly rotate it along this uh, symmetry axis, and update this rotation measurement to the one that has a minimum loss relatively to this global global rotation. Right? So it's like specifically, what we do here that uh, because we already we assume like we already know this rotation order and the rotation axis, right? And in the wrong time, we explicitly rotate for each measurement. We rotate our, we rotate our received rotation measurement, and so that it can reach to the minimum loss, to this uh, or to this uh, R to this R W O right to make the and we we update this measurement to make sure that the, it has a minimum loss, and then we take this measurement for our optimization. So that's how we handle this uh, rotational symmetry. And uh, other than this uh, rotation symmetry, we also need to handle this uh, measurement of uncertainty, right? Which is a uh, we can be caused by this uh, perspective ambiguity and the occlusions. For example, like in this case, we can see that when we flip this object uh, by a hundred degree, and uh, its appearance looks almost identical from the certain viewpoint because it's uh, perspective ambiguity. And so for you, so if we if we ignore the information and directly take all of them into our into our optimization, we'll have this. Uh, we'll have a lot of false measurements, and we will get. And we will probably end up very. We will probably end up with a very bad estimate at the end. So that's why, like in our work, we model this rotation, rotation as the mixture of the Gaussian. Right? For each component, it represents like a component of this rotation representation. Right. So in this case, we probably have this two. We probably have this have this two components, and to, to handle in this uh, to handle this uncertainty in this uh, uh, in the optimization, we use this uh, max. We use this um, max mixture. Oh, sorry, we using this mixture of the Gaussian representation, and to optimize it, we using this sum mixture formulation, right? So which means that for each uh, stage, when we whenever we receive a measurement. We only maximize the one component at each stage. So this max is a constant can be considered as a selector of this uh, of over the entire distribution. So whenever we have a new measurement, we only optimize a certain component, right? Not the full, not the full distribution. And uh, here's a, just a visualization of this uh, distribution of the object rotation. So for the visualization purpose, we only visualize it on this uh, on the x axis, on one axis. So we can see that for object, uh, multiple modes exist because of this uh, perspective and the ambiguities, which is similar to this object. Right. So, but we can see that when we receive more and more rotational measurements, the mode of this correct rotations becomes more and more clear compared to this uh, false compared to this uh, wrong. Most. Okay. Okay. And uh, so that's uh, the that's uh, the like uh, the explanation of our approach, right? And uh, before jumping to this uh, evaluation results of our approach, uh, uh, any questions so far? Before jumping to, into more details for this for this experiments. 
I sorry. So from your last slide, um, yep. uh, when you have three components, it seems like the two wrong components, like component, uh, is it one and three? Are are, are they correct and or, or or are they wrong? I mean, component. Uh, one. Sorry, which one? You mean the yellow one and the, the yellow one, one and the red one? Yeah. So. For both for Which the yellow is... and the red, they are both of them are are wrong are the are the wrong are the wrong rotation, right? Okay, so, so you can see that the green one is exactly yeah, the green one is the correct one. So you can see that at the beginning, right? As uh, from like after two viewpoints, we have we have the two peaks, right? So which uh -huh. is the which is a green one and uh, this red one, right? Because it's the uh, ambiguity, right? And when we kill, when we have uh, when we Visit more viewpoint and accumulate more measurement, more research measurements. There is a possibility that we we like a, another component, a Gaussian component, is added because of the because of the another false measurement, right? Yes. But uh, what we assume is that uh, when we visit more and more viewpoints, the correct uh, the correct uh, component will get more and more measurements, right? Which means that the weight is just getting it just getting boosted for this component. I see. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any more questions before jumping more to the experiments? All right. Okay. I will continue. Okay. So for our for experiments, right? So for example, before we jump into this evaluation results of our approach, we first of all we want to we want to present a data set we are using, and. So to demonstrate uh, the advantage of our work, we actually create, uh, we actually collect our own data set. It's a Robbie data set, the reflective object in the bin data set. The professor was and gave it a very nice name, Robbie data set. So this data is uh, our is uh, public available in our trail website. So this is that this uh, this this data set is a multi-view data set with this uh, highly reflective objects. It includes these seven industrial object parts with different level of the reflectivity and is in the different bin scenarios. So, so we see that, right? We capture our robot set. We using this uh, two camera, two depth sensors, one high cost uh, industrial camera, the Insensor camera, which is ex uh, like exceeds the $10,000. And another real sense camera, which by uh, low cost one, probably only like two hundred USD dollars. Right. So in this example, we we see that uh, <clears throat> sorry, in this example we see that uh, this uh, sample data captured using these uh, two cameras. We can clearly see that for this Insenso camera, for this camera, it's able to capture a lot of geometric details for the object. But certainly, there's a lot of the missing depth data because this uh, surface reflection, right? And in comparison, we can see that uh, for the data that is captured by the real sense, we have their the quality it just uh, it's uh, much worse, right? And uh, for the entire data set, we collect uh, these nine bins for each individual object, right? And to better represent our bin the bin picking scenarios, we separated all these bins into this uh, full bin and low bin. And the one novelty for our data set is that uh, we capture this the ground truth of this object. Sorry, sorry. Uh, we captured the ground truth of this uh, depth for the object, right? which is, uh, which is uh, like missing for most of the data set. Right? So, so what we do is that uh, for this uh, data set, we first uh, apply the scanning spray to capture so that we can capture this ground truth depth map. And in the second scan, we wait for this self evaporation of the scanning spray and capture the, and capture this raw data for the reflective objects, right? And uh, from actually from this image, we can see we can clearly see this the difference of this uh, shiny object and this um, and the object with its matte surface. We can see uh, how much missing depth data and uh, how much uh, like a big drop when we have this reflective surface compared to this uh, version object surfaces. Right? All right. Okay, and to capture and to capture and to, to for network because we our work is a, basically is a combination of this uh, neural network and uh, and this uh, and this uh, tr traditional optimizing based approach, right? And for our neural network training, uh, we we for this purpose we generate uh, a lot of synthetic data based on this uh, provided the three D object models, 
So we train our objects into localized network using this synthetic data only. And for the evaluation, for the evaluation purpose, we compare our approach with this uh, COSI pose, which is actually a, a state of art literature approach. It's a batch based approach. So for this approach, uh, the COSI pose is, uh, this approach is, uh, is a, it's like a post level fusion approach. So what did people, what is the uh, approach do is that uh, it leverage, uh, it just uh, take this, it just uh, treat this uh, object post animation, the single view object post animation as a black box. So that gets uh, the, the uh, to get the post estimates from individual viewpoints and uh, perform this uh, post level fusion to get this uh, fused object post. Right? So we compare our approach against the, with this COSI pose. So for a fair comparison, we use the, we use the same uh, we use the same outputs from this uh, from from each individual frames, which means that we use the same segmentation mass. We use same two D We use the same two D center and they use the same the three uh, D rotation measurement from this template matching. So we can clearly see that um, our approach right can it is. It can basically it can reach uh, can it can reach this upper bound of this RGBD version of COSI pose, right? right? And compared to this RGB version of COSI pose, we basically we actually exceed a large portion of it. And so this scenario is more is more clear on this uh, real sense data set. Right? For the real sense data, as we can see, as we mentioned before, the, for the real sense, the depth quality is much worse. Then we can see that our approach, basically using RGB data only. It can exceed this performance of this RGB version of this COSI pose. And uh, and uh, as and another thing I want to show here is that uh, as we discussed before, right, our core idea of our approach is to explicitly decouple this uh, stick D pose into the translation and the rotation, and to do this uh, do this a uh, two steps D sequential process. So in the first stage, we estimate this uh, uh, object translation. Which provides its uh, skill and the depth for our rotational part, and uh, for and the rotation estimation, it can be simply and can be greatly simplified by it. So we compare. So to demonstrate this uh, effectiveness, so we come we just uh, implement another version of our approach, which is a simultaneous process, which means that uh, it does not rely on this uh, two-step process. It simultaneously estimates uh, this. Uh, Object po object uh, translation and the rotation at the same stage without this two step without this two step sequential process. So we can see that using using this two step process, we are able to get this uh, higher detection rate and a much faster runtime speed. Right. Okay. And uh, so yeah, to conclude our work, right? In this work, we implement we have implemented a multi view object post estimation framework for this textureless objects using this RGB images only. And our core idea is to decouple our posterior distribution into this translation, 3D translation and the 3D rotation. And uh, using this uh, two-step multi-view optimization framework, we're able to first solve this uh, skill problem in the RGB image, and, uh, which, uh, and then it greatly improve this uh, rotation image performance. And moreover, and finally, we have apply this uh, max symmetry formulation to explicitly handle this object symmetry and to counter measure this uh, measurement ambiguities from this uh, rotation, from appear from this rotation part. And for our next step, uh, we have this two direction we want to perform, right? One is to complete a full slam, to build a full slam, which jointly estimate this object, uh, sorry, which jointly estimate this camera pose and this object pose simultaneously. And another direction that uh, we want to strictly select the camera viewpoint so that we can estimate this uh, reliable object pose using this minimum number of viewpoints. Uh, all right, so that's what I want to present today. Uh, thank you for the thank you for listening. Thank you, Jin. That's a very interesting uh, talk. And so now is the QA section. Any any questions from the audience? Please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Yeah. So why is like two-stage approach uh, much faster than the simultaneous uh, estimation? Yeah, so last yeah. Slide. yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. So uh, for this approach, so for the simultaneous process, right, we 
uh, we still like uh, how to say like we still perform this uh, 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 like uh, this uh, object translation using this uh, multi view optimization and uh, this uh, rotation and this rotation optimization using a max mixture. But the only difference for this simultaneous process is that uh, it does not rely on this uh, estimated scale information from this translation, oh. which means that. Uh, which means that in, if you go back to our original equation, right? Which means that uh, for the simultaneous approach, it does not assume this uh, dependence. It treats this uh, rotation and the uh, translation independent. Yeah. So for yeah, so for that one, it just that its uh, rotation and the translation are, in, are independent, and the estimate of this rotation does not rely on that estimate the scale information from the translation. Right. Cool. I see. Okay. Yeah, and uh, maybe another question is, uh, uh, how do you do rotation estimation based on template matching? Is that like uh, uh, maximizing the overlap between the uh, estimated mask and the yeah. template mask? Or... Yeah, so yeah, basically the yeah, idea is very like, uh, yeah, basically like this, but uh, so, for this template matching, right, we're using this uh, this approach, right? The template matching for the template matching part. Right? So what it what is uh, what the approach do is that uh, first of all it render this uh, uh, this templates in the offline stage, right? And uh, for this particular approach, it leverages a gradient information, right? So for the training image, they extract this gradient information, and uh, when they perform this template matching, they they compute this gradient response between this test and the train templates. And uh, the estimate post, you should get, if it is correct match, you, should, you are supposed to get a very high gradient response. So it's like, a, yeah, like you mentioned, like it's, it, it can be considered as like a, a more advanced version for this uh, mask comparison, right? But you just use more like, a, like more feature level information for this uh, match. So like it's about matching the edge of matching. the... Yeah, like the matching the critical edge, like this the contours and this inner edges. Right. I see. I see. Yeah, that's a pretty classical approach. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we compare this like template based matching for uh, representation with like uh, direct regression or uh, like estimate the features and do the correspondence mm -hmm. and then yeah. doing PMP? Yeah. How do we compare this approach? Yeah, so yeah, actually, that's a great question. That's actually what I investigated for a long time, right? So first of all, the direct regression, right? So like in the literature, there is a couple approach. They directly do this uh, regression. They using the, either this uh, uh, quaternion representation or this uh, the algebra space, right, to directly estimate the rotation vector, right? And or there are some, and even there are some approaches to directly estimate this three by three trans rotation matrix. So I would say like for this direct regression, it's, uh, I would say because of this, uh, um, yeah, this linear space in this rotation space, right? It's generally the direct regression is, uh, has a very poor performance, right? Yeah, big, yeah, it's difficult for the network to directly learn this uh, rotation. And uh, for another, uh, for another direction, you no, know, what people do is that they to cast this uh, rotation estimation as a classification problem. So what they do is that uh, uh, for each viewpoint, right? So they just uh, describe the entire rotation space, and uh, they estimate this uh, out of plane rotation as a classification problem, and do a, a regression for the for this in plane rotation. So that's another direction. So for that pro for that direction, uh, it also it's at it is definitely way better than the direct regression. But for that approach, it also suffers from this uh, skill problem, right? So, because even if it's a network, even even if you use even if you use network, you still need to train this uh, network at a different skill and uh, different depths, right? So I would say, like for our approach, actually <clears throat> for our approach, and um, it uh, does not. So for this kind of approach, it does not uh, very dependent on this template matching, and it can be. Like and actually can be replaced by, like by this uh, classification based approach. So because the, the the core the the major compute contribution from us is that uh, we presented a two step process. Right in the first step we provide a skill and this will greatly simplify rotation estimation. No matter you're using a template matching 
or this is the classification or even regression based direct regression based approach. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, yeah, for the first for the first part, I think uh, for principles, they are adopting the five uh, D representation for the rotation that was proposed two years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and they are not directly regressing the matrix or quaternions, but uh, in all the experiments, you are you are like uh, so for your principles, uh, for the principles experiments, you are like using their models which I think in their at least their single uh, single view uh, models they are using direct regression for both rotation and translation uh, yeah they do yeah for the principles yeah and you mentioned that like you are using the same rotation estimation for your experiment and theirs yes yeah, so, so no actually yeah so yeah so let me explain the results yeah so for this uh, cozy post, right? Yeah. So for the cozy post, uh, cozy post uh, in the original cozy post, they present, they, they present, they made the two contributions. So one contribution is that they provide, they provide uh, their own single view based uh, estimation, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. the directly regression based approach, right? And uh, another, and uh, that's the one contribution. And the major contribution from cozy post is a uh, multi view post level fusion, right? So yes. for that part, it's agnostic to any particular post estimator. Uh -huh. You can either they can either directly using their single view estimator, or they can directly using any state of art uh, post estimator, right? But for our work, right? Because uh, in order for a fair comparison, what we want to demonstrate is that uh, using the same like a periphery measurement information, right? Our approach can fuse better, can get a better estimate using our fusion approach, right? Compared to their post level fusion. So okay. we using the same post estimator. So this whole, in our case, in our implementation, the co post is not from their single view estimate. It's uh, oh. this our approach, right? So given with so the question we want to answer here is that they're giving the using the same information, same preferred merit from each individual viewpoint, are we able to get a better performance? Right. That's what we will demonstrate in these results. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but just out of curiosity, have you tried like uh, just use their models, uh, their direct, uh, direct regression model and uh, train it on your synthetic data set? And, uh, yeah, test yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, that's actually my yeah, yeah actually one of my future work. We want to we want to show right because uh, for the co they they on the BOP on the BOP benchmark they claim to be the yes. rank first right yeah that's so yeah actually that's uh, the next I want to what we want to try right. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in terms uh, of, yeah. 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 I think that that would be cool if like to compare like direct regression and uh, uh your approach, type of matching based approach. Because yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, their their performance is really impressive. And also uh, yeah, maybe one more thing is like uh, for, for current BOP benchmarks, the top one approach is uh for surfing bed, uh which is uh, embedding surface into a feature space and doing uh, feature matching there. Uh, yeah, that's also another way to do post estimation. Uh, yeah, you maybe mean, we can uh, check. You mean yeah. estimate the key point or the dense correspondence or that kind of part? Yeah, dense correspondence. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, yeah. 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 Also, I'm also curious how do how do you think of that? But yeah, maybe we can we can uh, like other to ask questions. We can for sure. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing. Good questions. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great QA. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? How do you see actually the role of object pose estimation in a like grasping pipeline? So there are people who argue uh, for bin picking, you don't need pose estimation anymore. You you just train an end-to-end -end model and the end-to-end -end model uh, model they they will be doing fine and i was initially i'm more a skeptic because i also did work on post estimation but if you think about we, we even had post estimation a post estimation talk here uh, i believe from uh, xiao was it your collaborator uh, from cmu who, who yes. in the end was also a little bit more skeptic and if i also look at at what peter abil is doing in in their in their object grasping pipelines I believe they do not use post estimation as an intermediate step from if you look at his talks. So yeah, so what what would you say 
it's like yeah, yeah. How, how do you see it in the in, in the full robotics pipeline i guess yeah do you, do you see it has a future or maybe it will have a comeback um yeah uh great question yeah that's true yeah you know i'm yeah because currently i'm also working as a part-time researcher at epson canada so in our office like in your company like people always have the debating right for the because for a major project is a is a bin picking project, right? So some people argue that, uh, oh, why we have to ask me posts, right? Why don't we just directly go for this grasping? Right? So I would say like, it's actually, it's a really task dependent, right? For for some tasks like this, uh, simply just to, we want to grasp object like this, uh, like this uh, pick and drop, right? We probably don't care like uh, how do we grasp, right? We don't care this, uh, so object post, we can directly perform this grasping. That's we only all we care is to empty this bin, right? That's uh, for this task. I would say definitely this end to end approach is uh, is a better way. But for some tasks like this uh, pick and assembly, right? So instead of only picks object, we want to pick object and know the exact post of the object and then do the subsequent assembly task. For that part, we definitely need to know this object post, right? For this. Uh, for com to complete uh, to finish this full pipeline, so so I would say you still like it for this. Um, I would say both direction they are valuable. It really depends on like what task, what we are looking for in this for the our end application. No, I agree on that. It's valuable. Also in AR, it's super valuable if you want to attach uh, some augmented information to an object and not just to you know a, a fixed scene. Um, for sure. Yeah. Also, I, I think the interesting question is. Uh, the picking context uh how because the initial motivation that roboticists would use was actually the picking task and basically you're saying the same thing that like for for pick and drop people tend to go to go away away from the structured pipeline for uh, sure i'm not sure and that that's kind of you know that's kind of like a surprising success of end to end because in other areas uh, of post estimation you don't have this so for example for visual localization where you try to I estimate the pose of a camera compared to a map. Uh, the pose estimation problem is still, as of now, better solved by a not end-to-end -end pipeline. The components in these pipeline may be neural networks, but typically the full, the full six DOF metric localization task is usually not solved end-to-end -end these days. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, compared to like if you localize against a map. And funny enough, like this object pose estimation for, for the bin picking at least seems seems to become uh, obsolete at least from what I fear, because uh, because we we just can generate graphs by having having some neural net predict good good contact points. Is that yeah? Is that? That's great. Um, so one. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Maybe this is the final call, so please ask if you have any.